thank you all for staying. Um, Paul, lock the doors. Cheers. Um, so, my name's Craig Taylor. Um, I work for a company called Ito World, Ito World, um, whatever it's called. Um, and I'm the data visualization design manager there. So, um, I wanted to take you kind of on a whistle stop tour of the design process to some of our um, newer projects that we've done, the thinking behind it, and how we sort of demonstrate data in 3D and animation. I do have one request, um, and this is my fault. Um, yesterday, uh, when I compiled my presentation, the first um, project I talk about is a, a project we've had with TomTom, Tom, and they're not releasing the project until the 24th. So if you could not maybe take any pictures and put them on social media <laughs> of the TomTom Tom section, uh, that would save me getting a slap on my wrist. Um, OK, so good, everything's moving. Right, so I, I head up our data visualization team, um, and um, my role there is to create um, high-end cinematic visualizations of our clients' data. We work with all sorts of different clients, from um, the Department for Transport, to Hyperloop, um, to LiftShare, TomTom. Um, and each one of our visualizations ticks three boxes, and that's um, engagement, insight, and narrative. So we like to think ourselves as interpreters of data. Each one of our visualizations benefits from us ingesting a huge volume of data, analysing that over time, and using creative imagery to engage and um, ultimately form some insight from our visualisations that our clients might not be able to get from some of the softwares they use. Um, we also like to think ourselves as storytellers as well. And each one of our visualisations is a user-guided experience through a data set you may or may not be familiar with, with the hope, by <coughs> with the hope that by the end of that presentation or that visualisation, you'll gain more of an understanding about the data we're showing you and the narrative we're trying to tell. Um, I've got a lot to get through, so I'm going to skip the show reel. Um, so first project um, that I want to talk about and the design process of this is quite interesting, actually, um, and it was for TomTom. Tom, and we're visualising some of TomTom's Tom's probe data for the city of Amsterdam. So headline statistics on their data, they've been working with information for more than 10 years. They have over 600 million connected devices. Uh, they generate over 3.5 billion kilometres of GPS measurements every day and have amassed 48 trillion GPS measurements to date. So what does that mean in terms of spatial, you know, how can we as cartographers understand that generalisation? So if you took a city of Amsterdam and you had no mapping data for it at all, using TomTom's probe data, you could accurately draw a street network for Amsterdam in about eight minutes of using their journey data. So it's a really, really granular data set. It's a really interesting data set. Um, and we had a lot of fun um, doing all sorts of visualizations for it. So the storyboard um, that we developed with TomTom Tom was um, split into three different chapters. So chapter one, we wanted to show a typical heartbeat for vehicle flow during a typical Monday. Uh, we'd augment that with different metrics to show the total number of journeys and how them journeys varied throughout the different commuter zones. Um, Phase two, or chapter two, involved um, comparing a public holiday, so that was King's Day, to um, a typical Saturday. King's Day also fell on Saturday, and how that varied. And we wanted to use some kind of intelligent spatial analysis to create a composite overview of, of what them trends were at the end of the visualisation. Chapter three was a little bit more experimental. We came up with some visualisation styles to isolate three different road networks in Amsterdam and create a view of congestion on each of them road networks. We'll talk a little bit about that. And I was delighted that our award-winning Coral Cities, <laughs> Tom Tom asked us to include at the end. And it's really interesting, the Coral Cities aspect, because they actually had real-world um, historic speed data for road network, which I'll talk a little bit about in a second. So there was a general theme to the visualization, and that was this shift from day to night. Each of our chapters showed 24 hours of flow or thereabouts, and we wanted to create a visualization where a user would look at it and understand the shift between day to night. Now, that's quite challenging for a cartographer and someone who works in data visualization because the base map, the cartography, and the tone of that base map dictates a lot of the visualization styles we'll use. So, for instance, a dark base map, we tend to use light emitting visualization styles, so things that work with additive blending, we have glow effects. Whereas if we went to a lighter theme, which I'll show in a second, we have to use, well, we like to use more real-world geometry that we can bounce shadows off and create more of a texture to the, uh, to the scene. So the project started with us developing two different concepts. So we had to have a dark concept and we had to have a light concept. And the fun part of the project, and it's always the fun part for me, is just experimenting. So we agreed very early on that we wanted to show speed profile data for the city. So the top left example there, 
Um, I wanted to express verticality a little bit more. Um, if we're working in 3D, it doesn't make any sense that our data's flat. So the height of the light trail and the color of the light trail is indicative of speed. So you can see the higher it is, um, the faster it's going, and then when it dips, that's when congestion's occurring. Um, middle example there and is, a, is an example that we work quite closely on and developed quite far was this idea of a point cloud. So we would take an hour's worth of GPS measurements and we would use the same, pro, uh, same idea of showing height of the, point, uh, of the point in accordance to speed and we'd, span, we'd uh, slide that hour slider along the day and we'd get this sort of, you could see these patterns of congestion and how they built up over time. Um, when we're looking at isolating road networks, uh, the top right example was we have this function in our software that lets us put virtual or geographic gates in and we can, only show, we can choose to only show journeys after a specific gate. So we can isolate journeys on a specific road network, which is really useful for understanding the pattern of congestion. So here we're showing the uh, build-up of congestion over time. So when, uh, when speed falls below a certain threshold, we keep the point there and we build that up to create this kind of heat map approach. The problem here is the disconnect you have between the ground plane and the higher points. So it's, it's easy to understand on a linear network like that, but when we look at the point cloud idea, and if we look at it in more detail, there's a big disconnect between some of the ring roads and understanding where that actually sits on a ground plane. Uh, the bottom two examples, again, are a little bit more experimental. So we had this idea of we'd gate the, gate the journeys, have um, only journeys on that road network show, but put all the journey start times to an epoch of zero. So basically, when we click go, we have this wave of propagation that goes along the road network. We can see where the fastest journeys are going first, and then you can see this buildup of slower journeys. And that's, um, that's a concept that we, work, that we developed through to the end piece. So the light theme. Now, in contrast to the dark theme, we have different visualization styles we use for a lighter base. So for instance, we like to work with real world geometry. So each one of them point clowns is a cloned sphere or a cloned cube. That means we can bounce light off it, we can create shadows, and we can create textures. So this looks wonderful. Is it a map? Is it data art? I don't know. <laughs> this looks great as a piece of data art, I think. Um, and it's interesting, but it's not really functional. What happens is that the density of points along some of the ring roads and the inner city means that you're masking areas behind. So it's as pretty as it looks and as interesting as it looks, it's not really a useful visualization in terms of showing um, actual vehicle flow and vehicle patterns. Let's get from moving on here. So again, some of the concepts that we work with with animating that point cloud um, are on the left-hand side there. So you can see how it's actually quite interesting. When you see it animated, you can actually see, especially down here, the congestion buildup on that ring road over time. Um, but again, it was, it was something that was maybe seen as a little bit too conceptual. You know, for someone who you know, works in data visualization or is, is interested in maps, they get that. But for someone who's you know, not really affiliated with that, it might be quite an interesting, con difficult concept to grasp. So we ditched that, prod uh, we ditched that visualization style. Um, another one we developed quite far along that probably well, it's quite right that it didn't get, uh, didn't get in the final piece was this idea of for lack of a better word, word lollipop cubes. So, <laughs> this again, using that same idea of the, the, the points that are moving over time and this idea of height being um, indicative to speed. But instead of the disconnect that you have with the ground plane, we thought we'd put a leader line in it. Um, I don't know, I don't, I don't particularly think it works that well. But it's an interesting concept to develop. It was quite fun to do. So the end piece, just get everything moving. So the end visualization is actually quite different to the concepts that we developed initially. Um, the problem was that we, had this prob that we had this problem with going from such a contrast between day and night. So we had this really bright white day palette with its own visualization styles. And then we shifted into night and we had another visualization palette, another palette with another visualization style. And to the user, it was difficult. It was almost like you were viewing two different data sets where what we wanted was a bit more synergy in it. We wanted a bit more of a connect. So what we did was we darkened up the base map, basically. So we darkened up the base map, and we, had, um, we used our light trails to show speed. So the color is indicative of speed. And 
we didn't want to lose all the 3D aspect to it. So verticality was difficult. We couldn't really work with it. But what we did was, um, for the head of them trails, we had these little clone spheres. So it created a bit of a texture to the uh, visualization. So 3D wasn't really that useless in it. Um, the shift between night and day in the top right, um, you can see the tonal shift of the base map, which kind of gives the impression that we're going into night. And we put these sun glares and sort of moon flare on to sort of simulate that. Um, again, we use a similar visualization style for the comparison piece. So you can see there the, uh, we use orange, an orange gradient for King's Day, uh, blue gradient for a normal Saturday, and you can see the variation in vehicle flow. But it's actually quite difficult to understand what the difference is between the flows until you actually put it on a map like this. So what we did at the end of that visualization, at the end of chapter two, was to bin all the GPS points into these hexagons. Um, and the blue hexagons show areas where vehicle flow on a typical Saturday was higher than vehicle flow on, a, um, on King's Day. So you can see there's less people in the centre of town um, during King's Day because everyone's celebrating. But then you get areas where there's more flow on King's Day than was a typical Saturday. So we can start deriving these patterns quite clearly. Um, Chapter three, again, this was more experimental again. So we would gate each one of the um, interested uh, road networks and we would spawn all these, all the speed, all the um, vehicle journeys for that day, all starting at zero. And the buildup of congestion over time can be seen by this accumulating heat map. Um, so you can start seeing patterns quite clearly. And again, it was just this idea of doing something a bit more creative, doing a bit some, something a bit different. Coral. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about corals in a second, but coral is our, um, our sort of signature data visualization for showing drive time catchments. And usually we would use um, you know, the available mapping, so um, either OpenStreetMap or Ordnance Survey, and we would use the road hierarchy or speed on that road network as a proxy for how quickly it is getting in and out of the city. So that's difficult because it's not an accurate representation of catchment areas. So TomTom Tom actually had speed profile data for each one of these network links. So we, we actually had an accurate view of what the speed was during an average weekday so we could create a more accurate coral representation. And we finished with that as a kind of hero image for the city and hopefully cities to come. So that was TomTom. Tom. That was the project. Um, I really like the, uh, just one more, the, the sort of explosions there. So it wasn't long before I created this small multiple visualization of lots of different intersections throughout um, Amsterdam. None of a reason, just because it's kind of cool. So, the award winning Coral Cities. <laughs> um, thank you, by the way, that was um, brilliant to receive. Um, so, Coral Cities was, it was by far my favorite project um, last year, and it was all about conceptually visualizing drive time catchments um, throughout a city. Um, but it's an interesting process to how we actually got there, and I want to talk a little bit about that. So we started working on a project with the Department for Transport where we were visualising um, drive time catchments, and rather than using the sort of generic polygon area, we wanted to expose the geometry underneath it, that road network, and do something with it that was a bit more in our sort of field of popping something out of the screen, so making it 3D. So first thing we did, we have this function in our software called Wavefront, so we take the centre of a city and we spawn thousands and thousands of journeys out from the centre of that city, and we can figure out the sort of the, art, art, the uh, sort of arterial pattern of that city. So the thicker the networks, the more vehicles are driving down uh, down it, and the sort of more optimal that route is out of the city. Um, much like Ken's example of the the sort of 3D aspect of um, his tube map, we've actually extruded each one of these networks in here to create a bit more of a 3D feel, a bit more texture, and a bit more of a pop to the visualization. But it wasn't enough for us. So we created drive time mountains. Um, and that was proportionally extruding the vertice closest to the center of that city higher up. So we created this kind of depiction of mountains. And it wasn't long before we um, inverted that to create what we now know as coral cities. So over 100 of these cities later, um, we created all sorts of sort of outputs for it, but the main one was this kind of animated small multiple view. Uh, we created posters, and um, they were at the LA Auto Show, and it was a really great project for us to show how we can be creative with data um, and how we can sort of change what is quite a generic data set into something more interesting. 
The problem was with this is that, again, like I said, we're only using OpenStreetMap and we're only using a very <coughs> idealised um, sort of road hierarchy in terms of speed. Um, so the, the actual drive time catchments aren't that accurate. Um, but it's interesting to see the form and function a road will take um, when we create these. Um, so this is a little bit different. I know nothing about sports, um, but I, I know a little bit about visualising data. And I recently found some really amazing sports visualisation data sets, um, which I wanted to do something creative with. I, I wanted to do something that maybe no one's seen before. So I found this NCAA data set, um, which incredibly, and I have no idea how they do this, so if anyone does it would be great to know, actually depicts all the different shots college basketball players made during, um, oh, there's, there's like five different seasons of play. So you have this visualisation here which shows where the point hierarchy is being scored from, so where the three pointers are being scored from, two pointers, and then what I've done to, to actually visualise what pattern that was is have this sort of accumulating pillar, hex map, or whatever you want to call it, to show where the volume of that flow was. And I just thought it was, for me, it was, a, it, was, it was a bit of a challenge to actually, well, how do we simulate a basketball trajectory? Obviously, basketballs aren't shot like that, but it was, a, it was more a project to sort of see how we can use our software to create these kind of conceptual visualizations of sports data. And we did all sorts with it. Um, this is showing all the missed shots um, for the different seasons. So you can see the season down there, and then the, the metric there shows the number of missed shots. And you can see the patterns in that, which is quite interesting. Um, this one, which I really loved and Reddit didn't, was <laughs> <laughs> buzzer beaters. Now, I knew nothing about a buzzer beater until my friend told me that it's the shot that's made during the last seconds of the game. So I was like, oh, okay, that's really interesting. So all the orange shots are people shooting and missing. So as you can see, they come from all both sides of the court, but the green um, traces and spheres are the ones that make it. Um, so yeah, it is a confusing visual. Um, it's, you know, there's not too much pattern in it. It probably would have benefited from, I think some of the, co the comments were why are you showing both halves of the um, court? I don't know, I, should I show one half of the court? I'm not too sure, but again, it was this idea of, oh, I'll take a data set and I'll see what I can do with it. And, I thought it was quite interesting anyway. Right. <coughs> Last project I want to talk about. Plot my pause. Probably the most important project I've ever created. <laughs> <laughs> this is Bryn. He's the goodest boy. He's the best dog in the world. I um, love him to bits, but he's a nuisance, right? So when he was a pup, you can almost see the cornfield in the back there. He just used to disappear in it for hours and hours on end. Didn't know where he was going. So. I was chatting to um, some people before, and, and I think one of the strengths of visualising data is finding your own data, and I really wanted to record Bryn's movements. I've obviously got some software I'm able to visualise it on, but I wanted to get my own data, record it, and see his patterns. I lost a few GPS trackers doing it, <laughs> because, well, you do. Um, but I finally got a rig that stuck to his collar, um, and before long, I was able to do this, which was just one week showing 14 of his walks. So what would happen is, as we went around the, uh, conserva the conservation area and went into the cornfield, he would start going nuts in the maze, and you can see the sort of linear tracks that he's taken running down the corridors. Um, I just thought it was really fun. I took it to another level. <laughs> um, I formed a Facebook group on my local village. I asked um, people quite weirdly if, I could, if they would let me track their dogs. Um, I met random people in the middle of fields. <laughs> <laughs> which, well, it is what it is. Um, and, but it was great because uh, the community let me track their dogs and the idea here was do different breeds of dogs um, have different tra tracking movements? Where do they deviate from their owners? Um, it was a bit of fun. Um, there's obviously not too much science in it, but I tried to make it. I tried to make it informative. So um, the visual up there shows sort of their tracks down here. Maybe I went a bit too far with creating these 3D heat maps showing where the dog... <laughs> Where the dog ran away from its owner. Both owner and dog had to have a tracer for me to do that. Um, yeah. um, and the, the kind of visual that we got was this, and it was it's a really cool visualisation of lots and lots of different dogs doing their own little thing, doing their own little dance. Um, part of the idea here was to kind of model 
um, my conservation area in far too much detail and kind of bring it into different softwares and um, I just thought it was a really fun visual. Um, it did take a long time because each owner got a very detailed breakdown of <laughs> where their dog deviated for. I don't think any of the people actually looked at this, but you will. <laughs> what, you can see, <laughs> what you can see here is the... Um, so this was all um, animated, this is an animated version, but you can see where the dog at each point of his walk deviated furthest from his owner. I don't know why, it, it doesn't really... Sh yeah, it's what it... <laughs> Um, but there was one funny incident, and this is um, Bernard, and he's a really naughty beagle, right? So um, Dave, the owner, took him for a walk, and I got a phone call halfway through the day saying, like, Bernard's gone missing, right at this point here. <laughs> he escapes, um, and he, he, he finds a friend here, and he just, he just hangs around with that friend for a little bit. And then uh, someone finds him, takes him to the vets, and at this point the vet rings Dave, and you can see Dave, making his way to the vet. <laughs> <No one cares>. <laughs> <laughs> problem was, problem was here is that um, it wasn't a beacon GPS. So when Dave rang me, he's like, where's my dog? I was like, I don't know. You need to get the tracker back for me to actually find out what happened. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah. um, and again, this is it's another fancy render showing uh, more walks of Bryn. I think the blue is showing... I, it's a bit fancy. The blue is showing where he's running, the, green, the orange is showing where he's running after the um, corn gets uh, taken away. So just a bit of fun, but um, some quite nice visuals. And then I took it a bit too far again. <laughs> <laughs> he took me all weekend accurately <laughs> modelling the conservation area, the trees, the grass. Um, and what I wanted to do is show all the GPS points as these little LED sort of cute uh, LED sort of lights, um, again, just because just I thought it was fun. Um, but yeah, that, that's it. Um. <laughs> if, you, uh, if you did want to know a little bit more about Coral Cities and some in-detailed analysis of it, there's a blog there if you want to have a look at it. Um, the TomTom Tom thing, I, I'm writing a blog, but it'll be released at the end of the month, so... Okay, I'm afraid we're way over schedule because I, I couldn't Sorry. hurry up these two talks because they were so interesting and that was fun. What a happy note to end on. But, thank you Craig. Another no round of applause for both Craig and Craig.